Welcome to On the Road to Literacy Success. I'm your host, Dr. Stacey Bain. This is a podcast where good humans gather together so that we can figure out what is working, what is not working, and what we can continue to do to improve literacy rates for all, without in data meetings and students rotting in centers. It's going to be an adventurous journey, so buckle up, sit back, and enjoy this ride. On today's podcast, we are honored to Zoom to Mississippi to speak with Rankin County School District's Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction, Angie Graham. Angie Graham's bio and information will be linked in the show notes. In full transparency, Executive Director Graham and I have been in collaboration for the last few years. I knew Executive Director Graham was the perfect guest when thinking about school systems who are ready to move Tier 1 practices forward. Have a listen and let us know your thoughts. Here's our guest. Executive Director Graham. Hey, how are you? Welcome, Executive Director Graham. Thank you so much for being on the podcast with us. Because of your expertise as a district leader, it's really fitting that you are our first district-wide leader to speak on the road to literacy success. At Educate, we believe in the power of practitioners and supporting their literacy wins through their smart teaching and leadership moves. So with your expertise, you fit this podcast listener's profile perfectly. We are so excited to have you on the road with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It is truly an honor to be here and to share my insights and my expertise and my experiences that I've gleaned through this journey with our implementation. And I just really look forward to connecting further with those who may be listening and I'm contributing to the collective growth of educators. Collective growth of educators, that's so important. I know that to be true for you, that you are all about taking what's already great and making it even better. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Executive Director Graham. Sure. On a personal note, I am a wife and a mother of two nine-year-old little boys who are having a fabulous third grade year so far. One of my boys, I was born profoundly deaf and is a double cochlear implant wearer. So he wears this in both of his ears and that was pretty instrumental in my journey when it comes to what, I've, what we've done in our district here. But on a professional note, uh, this is my 31st year in education two of which have been in the private sector, 28 have been in the public school setting. Um, I am a elementary certified teacher in K-3, 4, 6. Even though the majority of my career has been in the secondary field, I was an elementary school teacher. I've had opportunity to teach third, fourth, and fifth grade. Uh, I've also had the honor of serving as director for the Huntington Learning Center here in the Jackson, Mississippi area, which is central Mississippi. I've also put my foot in the little pool of the CTE world and served as a special populations coordinator. I've done district testing. I was an assistant principal for a middle school on the Mississippi Gulf Coast and survived Katrina while being an assistant principal at a middle school on the Gulf Coast. Came back to the central Mississippi area, was an assistant principal at a high school in the Rankin County School District, which is where I currently serve as executive director of academics. And this is my fourth year in this position. Uh, so it's just, I feel like I've done a lot. I've had a lot of wonderful opportunities and just excited to be here and very blessed with my journey. Listening to your background made me really tired. There's some days I am, but it's very invigorating. I can only imagine you wake up, K-12, how many people again are in your school district? We have over 18,500. So you are a county school district. How many different regions is that again? Uh, we have 3,000 employees, and of those employees, 1,700 are certified teachers in the classrooms. So we are the second largest district in the state. So we, we, we've got a very diverse representation in our district from very rural to very suburban and anything in between. So as that district leader of a large school district, second largest school district in the state of Mississippi, number one, it again makes me tired just to think about the job and the work that you do and what you're responsible for. So thanks for all you do every single day. Why do you do what you do? What helps you to wake up each morning to get up, to go to slay with the 3,000 employees that are in Rankin County School District? What drives you as a leader? As an educational leader, my drive really stems from the commitment to the future of our students, pouring into them, empowering educators, so we continue to foster the passion that they have. But we want to make sure that we provide an environment where students really do thrive and that they all have the opportunity to learn. That is what really drives me. Also, the opportunity to create strategic change 
at the district level. I want to make sure that we are ensuring equity and providing access to education for all while collaborating and continue to look, grow and learn and myself and pouring into myself and those that I have the honor of serving with. Uh, but ultimately, my goal is to help build a stronger, more inclusive educational system that prepares our students for success beyond the classroom, because that's that's where they're going when they leave us. We want to set them up to be the successful citizens that are our future. So each morning, you now I wake up, I get energized with the possibility of being able to make a difference, not just in the lives of students, but in the lives of the educators that I serve with, the community that we serve. It just keeps me going, knowing that I'm making a difference, knowing that I am a part of a team that is creating opportunities for students to achieve their fullest potential is quite, quite powerful. So it's just, it's, it's just incredible. That's what motivates me and that I have the pleasure and the honor to serve and to do this. And that's what gives me purpose and the passion for each and every day. And you've been having a literacy movement. Did anything shift when you started to focus more heavily on what is the science of reading? How are we going to make some shifts? Absolutely. I feel like my whole purpose really arrived when I started to dig in and started to shift and have this focus heavily on literacy, but not just focusing on that, but what does the research say? What is the data that supports that research? And really realizing the way I was taught, the way I taught my first few years in this business wasn't doing what's right for all students. It makes me reflect, it makes me a little sad that I did not know then what I know now, but I'm fortunate that I do have this opportunity to make a difference and to pour into not only the students, but teachers and especially our young teachers that are coming up into this profession that can take this and continue on and allow that to continue to blossom and to grow as we pour into students. But it, think about it all the time. Literacy is everything. And our, our kids deserve it. Our future deserves that. Which is a nice way to go into the next question. There are school superintendents and executive directors listening to this podcast, not just in the United States of America, but across the world. And in fact, just in the last three podcast episodes that we have published with On the Road to Literacy Success, we are trending in Australia and New Zealand. Isn't that fun? I, I'm thinking that's most likely because our first guest was Dr. Nathaniel Swain who is an author, researcher, and practitioner from Australia. So there we are. So That's knowing- you Get a chance to see that podcast and thoroughly enjoyed listening to, to what he had to share. Very practical. Yes. So thinking about the people who are currently listening right now as they're driving to work or coming home from work or it's the weekend and they're popping around in the garden, give us a scoop. What has been happening in the Rankin County School District under your leadership and the people in which you serve with? What have you been doing? Oh, we've been doing a lot, but I feel like I need to kind of give a little background information that would help. Three years ago when I started as executive director, my superintendent, who is still our current superintendent, gave me a charge. He said, I want you to do two things. We need to expand literacy and take a heavy, deep dive look into literacy and improve that for our students. And we need to bridge elementary and secondary in K-12. So at the time, we were gelling, but not collaborating to the depth that we really needed to be collaborating because I don't think we really understood each other's worlds like we do today. So those were the two charges, but I can remember walking out going, okay, where do I start? Well, that same year, because I had moved into this new position, we hired a new elementary curriculum director, Dr. Melissa McCray, who brought 30 years of experience in her career, all centered around the science of reading research and structured literacy instruction. So she started really helping me understand the value in digging into research how the brain works and how to teach children how to read and the different components that goes into all of those things. So it was quite the journey shifting because a little background on our district is that we had been a balanced literacy district for many years, very successful. We have a tradition of excellence here in our district and we've maintained the highest rating that our state can, can award to a district. However, we weren't really meeting all the needs of our students. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a moment. But we started digging in and realizing what we had been doing. And even that particular year, what we were still doing really wasn't the right thing to do. That We needed to figure out a way to shift a whole mindset, not just internally at our office, but across the, across the district with the 3,000 employees that we had. We needed to shift in our mind, started to realize the, the approach that I had been taught in college to teach young children how to read wasn't what was right for all. 
it was meeting some, it was not meeting all. So we also started to present some of this research to administrators and in subtle ways, embedding it in some of the PD, embedding it in conversation, embedding it into things that we were pushing out as far as newsletters and some other information, but we had not made a total shift yet that first year in the instruction so that year one really was involved in research. So we get to the end of year one, it's like, all right, we've got to do something. Now we need to start implementing this. How is this going to look? We've got to get out there in the trenches. We've got to put this in the, in the arms and the hands of our teachers and our administrators who see and work with our students every single day to make the difference. So we saw an opportunity through our state department to attend a middle school focus on literacy type training. Remember, the other charge that I had from my superintendent was to bridge pre-K-12. So I was now in charge of elementary and secondary curriculum. Well, when I saw this opportunity, the way our district is structured, sixth grade either lands in an elementary setting, depending on the school zone or the school, or it may land in a middle school setting. But I thought, here we go, middle school, sixth grade through eighth grade, we're going to hone in and, and focus on here. And that's how I can get elementary and secondary to kind of start joining forces and let's learn this together. So we attended a training that made all the difference in the world for me as a leader. And it really was what shifted us to the pathway that we're on with structured literacy. Um, but it, it changed things. Things started to really make sense. It was the aha moments for me sitting there and listening to what was shared. It made all the research and everything I had been reading about, it came to life. I got to see it modeled and even the second day of the five-day training, I thought, this is it. This is where we've got to go. We've got to jump on this and bring this to our district. So very quickly moved, got the approval that I needed to get, got the funding support that I needed to get, and we were able to land that training in our district. Uh, so year two, we started training. We trained all of our sixth grade teachers, which is about 125 in that grade band. Uh, then we trained our fifth grade teachers, our fourth grade teachers, and then we went on down to kindergarten and second grade that first year. So a lot of training took place, a lot of aha moments for those teachers in those trainings because they were all in. And, and in addition, we were also continuing to bring the information to our administrators. However, it was a pretty unconventional way of doing it. I wanted to target teachers and then bring the administrators on board because we were moving so quickly. I wanted to get it moving, which is not the traditional way of doing initiative and shifting. Usually you train the principals first and then you get the teachers on board, but we did it a little bit different and I'm really thankful that we did, but our teachers really just dug in. So year two was all about training. We got them trained. We got them going. They were implementing this in the classrooms, but we had to go bigger. We had to continue to branch out beyond those grade bands that we had trained. Uh, so we, year three, here we went and we ended up training our third, our seventh and our eighth grade teachers and any new hires that we got had that had not previously been through it. So by the end of year three, which was this past school year, we had successfully trained all of our kindergarten through eighth grade teachers on structured literacy, the science of reading with a very systematic strategic framework that we were following across all grade bands, across all contents. We were starting to see the difference in, in, in our data. And at the end of the year three, two, that's where we really, really had to dig in deep because sustainability needed to be what this actual school year, year four, because we needed to be able to sustain this far. We needed to get people trained that could sustain it in their buildings beyond my team and myself um, and those up here at county office that provide the support. So we did an intense training with leaders that were representative of all of our schools that house K-8, whether it was teacher leaders, administration, we had administration represented from just about every one of the schools. Now we're in the phase of what's your implementation plan? How can we support that? Let's see it in action and let's keep going. So I jokingly refer to this journey as the fast and furious implementation, but it really, really has been. Uh, it's not been all roses and pretty. We've had some hurdles. We've had some hiccups. We've had some roadblocks along the way. We've backed up and just kind of kept going. So it's exciting this year. We're in this fourth year. We're seeing it work. I'm seeing it with my own children and the work that's coming home. It's just so exciting to see we're still pushing. 
you know, we're still supporting and not letting up on the throttle at all. We're still going, but that that's kind of what we've been doing in the last three years. And now on our fourth, just an overview for over 20 years, our district has been a balanced literacy district, uh, which we've had success. We have maintained the highest rating that the state of Mississippi awards to school districts, but we were not reaching all of our students. And, and I'll, I'll get to the data part of it in just a little bit. I don't know telling us that we weren't reaching them all. Can you timestamp that for us? So 20 year history of balanced literacy. You live in the state of Mississippi. Mississippi started this movement 2013-14. Help, let's define that. So are you saying that in the state of Mississippi, what does this mean? It's a little trip back in history. Mm -hmm. I think it was around 2013-14, like you said, that the state of Mississippi started transitioning to the science of reading and structured literacy for the instructional delivery um, method. And we just didn't buy into it as a district. We kept doing what we were doing because we were having success with it. We we're maintaining our A status as a district. Mississippi really started to dig in as a state. And our state department and those leaders at that level really did some tremendous lifting and some tremendous work in spreading the research and spreading the truth about how students deserve how to be taught, to be honest, and started making a difference in the state. We still were maintaining that A. So I think it was around 2021 is when I, I think that's right, when I first took the seat here and started to dig in and realize, and I was finally in a position, I should also share, I was finally in a position where I could make a difference in the elementary and secondary setting. Prior to that, I had only been focusing on secondary and really was not in a position to support to do anything or to really have a need to dig into that. But being in this position, I had that opportunity to dig in and I had the opportunity to make a difference. So I jumped in with two feet and did it. And I'm really glad that you explained that because I think that a lot of people think, oh, Mississippi, Southeast, no union, whatever the State Department says, the school districts will do. And so I'm glad that you clarified that for the listeners because the reality is, is across America, everybody is locally controlled. We we have the autonomy to do. Our State Department will give direction. There's some things that are mandated, but we have the autonomy to instruct how we want. That's why we didn't buy in. When they did that in 13, we didn't buy in for a long time. We should have, but we didn't. I do know some state departments on the West Coast that say we cannot talk to school districts about what literacy instruction looks like because the school districts are locally controlled. So allowing balanced literacy to continue because as a state department, it's hands off. So if we're in a seat where we have influence, and I think that that's what I love about your story in particular, because you are the story of we did have state department support. And we decided to continue on with the balanced literacy approach. When you got into the seat, things changed. When Dr. Rimes was there, when you have this collection, this body, this current movement has been able to move you into what does the science of reading look like in a school system? Acknowledging that you were doing great before. I did. We did. And we had great scores that was affording us the, the A rating that we had earned. However, when we really started to dig into the data, we were not meeting the needs of all the students. In that particular year that I started this, this journey for me, when I say I started, I was looking at the subgroup data and even, well, let me back up, our proficiency. That particular year, our proficiency rating, we were roughly 60% proficient. Well, 60% proficient, we were still an A, but in reading 60%, well, it wasn't enough. And when I went and presented it to our superintendent, I kind of laid it this way to him. And this is where I was able to really gain the support from him to start implementing some things. But I, I shared with, with him that, you know, we're 60% proficient. Essentially what that's saying is you line up 10 students right here in front of us and you look at them and you say, one, two, three, four, five, six, you all are going to read. We gotcha. One, two, three, four, sorry, you're on your own to figure it out. Good luck. That's what we were doing. We were maintaining an A, but we were leaving so many students out there to figure it out or families out there to figure it out. 
And it was, that one's right. And when I shared that analogy with them or that, when I presented it to them that way, that was impactful. It just came to me. One that I had planned on, it just came out. And I was like, whoa, you put faces to it. It makes a difference. And I remember asking, and I said, I don't know about you. Which four would you pick? I don't know if I could pick four, but that's what we're doing. And that's not acceptable. We were not doing what we know in our hearts was the right thing to do. And that started the shift. For people who are listening right now, they're probably thinking, what What was so transformational? Executive Graham, spill the tea. You not only share with us the research, you were modeling for us how it could look. Mm. You were modeling some different ways to do um, read aloud or different ways to phonetically approach a word. All of it was starting to make sense. It was just clicking. Because remember I shared a little bit about my little boy with the cochlear implants. That's how he was being taught at the special school that he was attending. And it wasn't making sense to me. I was doing the homework with him. But until I attended that training and saw you essentially doing what he was learning and what I was seeing for the homework, it just didn't resonate. And at that time, he was successful. And I was seeing it work in my own home. So I knew that that's the direction we needed to go, not just for my child and my children, but other people's children that we have the honor of serving and educating. So it just, it was, it was a personal and a professional wow to me. But there was something that you said that just was bam, hmm. mic drop. There is no amount of tier two or tier three instruction that can undo an effective tier one instruction. And that was a wow. I immediately sent the text to my superintendent and say, I think we have found it. Listen <laughs> to this. And I typed out that phrase to him and he said, you need to come see me. Thank you for joining On the Road to Literacy Success with Executive Director Graham from the Rankin County School District in the great state of Mississippi. Would you like a 25% increase in your data? Then you are going to want to log in for part two. You can do that by subscribing to our YouTube channel or go to goodhumanseducate.com and sign up for our newsletter. We are unstoppable together, especially when we set the cornerstone of tier one. Thanks for being on the road and we'll see you next time.